of their opportunities. It'll take me just a second to get the uh, transparencies up. I have, as you know, passed out some of my transparencies. You'll find some typos, and some of them got there because uh, of my errors. Others got there because of the process of, re, uh, of, of taking them from one program to another. Uh, Gary Trudeau was here last year during the week that we ran the first of these courses, Jackson, His Legacy and Times, and this appeared this April, and I can perhaps read it to you. Uh, I guess my conscience is, is becoming, uh, somebody else read it, I'm having a hard time seeing it here. I can read it here. I guess my conscience is finally kicking in, Boopsy. The truth is I've served over 3 million calories at McFriendly's, only 800,000 of them necessary for weight maintenance. That's a lot of excess, right? On the other hand, I was but a lonely server. I was just filling orders. And Boopsy says, but wasn't that the Nuremberg defense? No, that was following orders. Then you're on good grounds, morally. Now, Greg Peterson and I, in our, uh, in our dreams, like to think that maybe Trudeau saw something about Nuremberg here when he was here last summer, uh, and this is where this cartoon came from. But that's the imagination that goes on at the Jackson Center. Here are the 12 subsequent trials. Uh, the 12 subsequent trials started right after the original Nuremberg trials. The Farben trial uh, was initiated on August 15, 1947. If, for those of you who know, that's the second anniversary of VJ Day, depending on which side of the international date line you were on, uh, and, and ended on July 27th, 20, 27th of, of 1948. It went for almost 11 months. It was, the judgment was controversial. Uh, one of the judges wrote a dissenting opinion, Paul Hebert, who was the, the dean of the College of Law at Louisiana State University, wrote a dissenting opinion. But here are the other 12, 11 cases. Uh, the, the last to finish was the ministry's trial, which finished in 1949, which is the anniversary for this event. Uh, surviving prosecutors are Ben Ferentz, who is a friend of the Jackson Center. Uh, ben Ferentz said to me a couple of years ago, when, we were, when I was talking to him about Farben, he said, they had to know, didn't they? Still uncertainty about what the general upper management of Farben knew about the events that were occurring across Germany and particularly at Auschwitz in 1943, 44, and 45. Here you can't see it well, but this is Henry King uh, at, the, at the Milch trial, which Milch was the commandant of the Luftwaffe, and uh, uh, Hermann Goering's direct assistant, I suppose, uh, tried and, and involved in the bombing of Rotterdam and other things. Uh, and uh, tried in early after the, the, the uh, medical trial, which, which we talked about the other day. Well, IG Farben, E.G. Farben, for those, Farben in German means color, and Farben started as a cartel of dye stuff manufacturers, dye stuff, Farbstoff, uh, dyes. We have to remember where we came from as, a human, as, 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 as citizens and human beings. Uh, before 1850 or so, we didn't have any synthetic dyes. If you were wealthy enough to be able to afford purple, which came from mollusks in the, uh, in the, in the Adriatic, uh, you could wear the wealthy uh, robes of, of purples. But by accident, while searching for a synthesis of indigo in, a, in an English laboratory, long story and I won't bore you with it, uh, William Henry Perkin accidentally produced a purple color which he called mauvine which all of the, uh, immediately, the textile manufacturers, the wool manufacturers in England found particularly valuable for the selling of, of new, new textiles. This is 1850 or so. And from then on, German scientists were fascinated, young men uh, particularly were fascinated by natural products, those things that we find around us. And those natural products were the things that grew, so they were, quote, organic. And these things that grew, they isolated and they found properties of them and then they went in the laboratory and they tried to make them. So that's the process. You find a natural product, you find that it has an application that you find of interest and useful, and then you try and make that synthetically because if you can do it synthetically from a very abundant raw material, you have available a cheaper source of that natural product 
then would be isolating purple from mollusks out of the, out of the uh, Adriatic. Lots of books on Farben. They started immediately after the trial. Uh, the first was by a man by the name of Richard Sosley, who wrote two books, one on Farben and the other on compulsive gambling. Uh, I don't know what the connections are, but we can, you, can, you can summarize. This happens to be, uh, this happens to be the Sosley book, but you can find lots in the libraries. The Farben trial was held at the courtroom 600, exactly the same courtroom as, as, was, held the, uh, as was held the International Military Tribunal. Here's a picture, prisoners in the dock in the front, the German defense lawyers. Uh, these, by the way, these are on your handouts, and you can find them in various spots. Um, here are the dates. Uh, London Accord, an important point to, to, to point uh, to, to Jackson is that every one of the subsequent trials uh, preceded, was preceded by both the Moscow Agreement, which said there's some heinous things going on. This is 1943, signed by Roosevelt, Churchill, and uh, uh, Stalin uh, in Moscow in 1943, which said there's some heinous things going on in Germany, and we're going to hold the leaders of Germany in account for these heinous crack, uh, crimes against humanity. And then the London Accord signed one day before the Nagasaki bomb was dropped, so August 8, 1945. I asked John Barrett if uh, Bob ja Robert Jackson knew about the Nagasaki bomb. He did not. He knew about the Hiroshima bomb, which was four days earlier. But this was the culmination, the end, the, the, the coup de grace for, for World War II. And so the Nashville, Tennessee, and these are drawings that were, were, were made by uh, an Ohio State lawyer whose name was Sidney Schaffetz. And these are on permanent loan at the Jackson Center. For those of you who were there the other night, you saw some of these line drawings. And this is the line drawing of the prisoners in the dock at the Farben trial, which you can see in the, in the Robert H. Jackson Center. Uh, and I want to point out a couple things about it. One of the things that if you look at the record for all of the subsequent trials you'll find is that they're, um, they're always identified by one name, specifically one name. And that's the name of the primary, uh, the person at the top of the leadership list charged at, as the, the, the first leader in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the indictment. And this is the Carl Krausch trial. Krausch is here. This is Hermann Schmitz, who was the CEO. He was he, the CFO, CEO, Schnitzler, and so on. Uh, you can't see it, but here are the charges. Uh, plunder, spoilation, slavery, and murder, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, and uh, furnishing Cyclone B. Uh, and building the plant at Auschwitz uh, were the, were the uh, charges, basically, and I'll show you the total uh, charges later on. Uh, this is an interesting drawing for, for a number of reasons, and I'll point this out so you can uh, say it to your friends over cocktails, and cocktails in the future. This happens to be the mirror image of the actual situation, which is, was, would have been, as, as the International Military Tribunal shows, Crouch would have been here. So this is a flip side from photography at the time. The photographer managed to, take, to, to uh, produce the print backwards as a result of the, uh, for some photographic accidental reason. And Chavez, who told me he had a thousand books on, on the Holocaust, uh, happened to pick this particular drawing to, to spend his time uh, working on. And uh, so we've had a little bit of fun with that particular thing. Um, I must tell you that my history in chemistry uh, has, has some interesting, uh, interesting connects that I had no clue about when I was writing my PhD dissertation. My first, about my first uh, literature citation is to a, a, a laboratory work from a University of Delft by a W.D. Cohen. The second publication is Heim Weizmann, Ernst Bergman, and Hirschberg. So little did I know in 1961 how famous my second reference was. Uh, and then the third is to a Professor James Pitts, who was uh, on the, uh, uh, in, in the US war effort in 1940 here and successfully uh, found the, the uh, uh, primary constituent of Los Angeles fog. Little do the students know who the people are that put those references in, in the literature when they're scientists. And if you follow the history of the people, it turns out sometimes to be more interesting than the science that's there to begin with. Um, now, it, these are some of the ideas that I've had as I followed the Farben history. It's been said history doesn't change, only the questions we ask about it seem to change. <laughs> 
It's also been said that countries don't start wars, people do, and I have to attribute that to Pat Buchanan's book, who I've just recently come in contact with. Buchanan wrote a book uh, recently, Churchill, Hitler, and the, on the Unnecessary War, uh, which really is quite interesting. It's really worth reading. If you, if you, if so I can't tell you that I've read any other of his speeches, but that one I found pretty interesting. And then, the, 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 as a scientist, I'm particularly interested in the personal histories of the individuals involved, both on the, on the science side in Germany and the science side in the United States. And I have to tell you, I have to make a confession that I would never have made as a 40-year-old full professor or a 25-year-old assistant professor, but I work for you as a research scientist. The scientists in the world uh, generally are funded for their programs by the governments in the countries which they live. And that's been my case for 47 years. Students have worked in my laboratories from all over the world, 37 foreign countries at last count. And each one of these individuals was funded by programs that were proposed by me, but funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the National Science Foundation, the whole, the whole spectrum of programs that are run by the federal government. Do I work for the federal government? No. But am I certainly indebted to the federal government for the programs that they've provided and the funds that they've provided? And are my students indebted? Absolutely. And therein lies one of the, the difficult dilemmas for the science future of the world, and that is scientists work for your governments. And if your governments lead, lead them astray, uh, the question is, how does, this, how does this all play out in, in the moral uh, and, and, eth and ethical questions that come about? Now, science itself, per se, has, has very, little, uh, very little in the context of you don't know when you do something what good it's going to be in most cases. I mean, the, the cases that are, are very direct are cases in which people work for the government on nerve gases, for example. But the number of those instances are few and far between. What one doesn't know is what one's, what's, what one's productivity is going to lead to. And I don't know why this thing keeps making that noise, so I'll just keep my hands up. Bit of personal history. I came from Chautauqua County. I'm probably the only person in the room that played basketball two years before Robert Jackson died at Frewsburg Central School. And I can tell you that I rode all the way from here to California and back again with the principal of Frewsburg Central School. So Bob Jackson was a graduate of Frewsburg. I've forgotten the year, but John Barrett would know. Uh, and uh, so that's my personal connection with Jackson. My grandfather was a businessman in, in the little town of Clymer. And Jackson did legal work for him uh, on a number of occasions through the 20s. So I heard a great deal about Jackson and Roosevelt and others during my growing up in Clymer. Not very much of it was good, I must say. <laughs> Perhaps you understand. Anyway, so I left here in 1956 and began to study organic chemistry at, very many, at several universities. Uh, the chemistry in the text that I studied, I now know, entirely came from German science. So the organic chemistry that was in the textbooks in 1955, 1956, 1957, 1958 was the textbooks of the dissertations that I've been reading as part of those nine PhD organic chemists who were part of the defense at, uh, at Nuremberg in 1947. Now just a bit about higher education in, in organic chemistry. What one does is, is generate with the direction of a mentor at an institution. Is that too low now? Yeah. Got to turn it up again, Adam. Okay. What one does is work under the direction of a mentor at a PhD granting institution somewhere in, in the United States. And out of that directed work comes a, an original proposal that one develops through experimental work mostly. And out of that comes the writing of a PhD dissertation. PhD dissertations date to the 1860s in chemistry and come originally from our German counterparts. So what we have done is produce a system that is basically the system used around the world now, which uses the mentoring sort of self-tutorial, um, almost apprentice system in the teaching of our students. And out of that come publications in the original literature of chemistry the published dissertation, either hard copy or now electronic copy, which is available for the world to use. Uh, in any event, um, the American chemistry establishment per se basically didn't exist before the end of World War II. Uh, 
Now, I'm sure that my colleagues who are still alive, who are in the American chemical, chemistry establishment before World War II, would argue with that vigorously. But the bottom line is that we in America did not have much of a scientific establishment before those things that helped us develop those devices and materials that were used to defeat the Germans and the Japanese through the 40s, uh, which transferred university technology mainly into the public sector and public domain. And out of World War II came what is uh, now the most important of our scientific support systems, and that's the National Science Foundation. And as I said before, we're the technical arms of government and a little bit of Chautauqua County is beautiful in the summer, but I must tell you, in the wintertime it's not so great. Here we have the, uh, the Chautauqua Institution stamp, I guess, during the wintertime. Well, what was Farben? Farben was an organized cartel of 11 chemical companies. Cartel means a collaboration of 11 individual companies. The biggest companies in the world, BASF, Bayer, uh, Hirscht, uh, Agfa, uh, all of these companies, by their own design, agreed to collaborate business-wise after the end of World War I. Now, it started before a little bit, but really, it really organized officially in 1925. The directors of Farben were the members of the individual boards. So Agfa had a board, Hirsch had a board, Pulse had a board, uh, BASF, Badesh Anil, and Soda Fabrik had a board. Uh, each of these board members was part of the larger board of directors of Farben. By the way, if you're interested, you can still buy Farben stock on the uh, Frankfurt Exchange. Not worth very much, but you can buy a share if you happen to want one. Anyway, organized in 1925 to collaborate. And what did they collaborate on? Well, they organized their manufacturing, they organized their sales, they organized their patent policy, very, very important. They organized their intellectual property and the way they presented their intellectual property to the world. They organized what they made and who, how they made it. And they obviously did lobbying and reactions to and interactions with the governments in Germany that happen to exist. They're not at all different from, in the United States, Standard Oil. Standard Oil organized itself as a major cartel. And in fact, some of the biggest collaborations before World War II were between John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil and IG Farben, Southeast Asia. And then we developed a synthetic rubber uh, project at the University of Akron involving the rubber companies and the universities in the United States, DuPont and other companies that basically made synthetic rubber here in a year and a half. But there was a collusion before that, you know, was not to the benefit of the United States because Rockefeller wanted to have ways that he would provide the raw materials to make synthetic rubber rather than from coal. But those are the collaborations that, that were available. So publicity, manufacturing, patents, and in 19, in 1942, uh, uh, 43, 44, Farben had the idea that they were going to be the chemical company in the world and take over the chemical manufacturing uh, for, for the world. And that was their, that was their Third Reich uh, motivation, which is very much like the motivation of the, of, the, of the government. Now, what was Farben prior to World War I prior to, and, and prior to World War II? German sci scientists invented organic chemistry. Those were the guys that said, I like the color of that red rose. I'm going to find out what the red is, and I'm going to make it so we can send that, sell that dye to, to places around the, around the world and make money from it. Uh, if you read Emil Fischer's PhD dissertation, Emil Fischer was the first organic chemist, first organic chemist from my field to win a Nobel Prize. If you read the first page of his PhD dissertation, published in 1873 from Strasbourg, well, why was a German in Strasbourg? Well, because they had won the Franco-Prussian War, and German chemists were sent, Adolf von Bayer and Emil Fischer and his students, were sent by the Prussian government to occupy the new chemistry facilities at the University of Strasbourg in 1873. So if you look at these very Prussian and German names, you'll find that several of the companies that were founded in 1875 to 1880 came from people who took their PhDs at the University of Strasbourg, not because Strasbourg was the source of their, of, their, of their intellectual spirit, but because they were sent there by the government to occupy those laboratories. Emil Fischer, brilliant man, lost two of three sons in World War I. He died in 1919. But a man who really drove the future of organic chemistry for many years from his laboratories at the University of Berlin.
he was fascinated by the color of the red rose, and he tried to make that red rose in, in the laboratories. And that was his, his success was he made some colors that we still use. The dye stuff that you find in, in the key uh, the hole in your car when you can't see it at night is fluorescent synthesized originally by Emil Fischer. And if you go to the laboratories of your local hospital and have blood tests, most likely they will look for your white blood cells eosinophiles, and those eosin was a dye made by Emil Fischer in 1873, 1874. So the chemistry that these guys did and the products that they produced, they were smart enough to get it out of the laboratory and into commerce. And that's the next part of the story. It's not just good enough for university professors to make compounds and make, make, make developments, but what is necessary is that they transfer that technology into the public sector. They transfer that technology into the private sector. They patent their work, and their patents produce licenses which make money for their universities. Ha, 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 ha. And if you want to talk about technology transfer in the academic industrial interface, that's another four hours. But the bottom line is that's the, that's the, that's the theory. Now, uh, just to, to point out where we were at this time, we, stop and think about this a minute. 30% of the deaths in World War I were from infections. Bullets didn't do it. Strept Streptococcus did. E. coli did. 30% of the people that died on all sides from World War I were killed by infections. And all these German guys came home and said, what can we do about that? So Heinrich Herrlein and his colleagues, Gerhard Domach and others, said, well, we're making all these organic compounds. Let's test them against some of those bacteria. So there was the bacterial theory of disease going into the laboratory. And they set up a test protocol in which every new compound that BAS had made was tested against streptococcus, was tested against E. coli, was tested against tuberculosis and other things. And out of that, they accidentally found that one of the dyes that they were making to color cotton, which was an orange-red dye, was toxic to streptococcus. And it turned out that as they did the analysis, they found that the, the analytical procedure showed that they had a specific group of atoms containing sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen in, in the molecule. And they traced this down further. They started giving it to patients who were dying of infections found that this, 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 uh, this, this new material that they had in right doses, if you sprinkled it on a wound, would kill the bacteria and the, and, the, and, the, and the toxin would disappear. And to make a long story short, in about three years, they produced the first sulfa drug, which was Pronticil. That was 1936, 1935. Pronticil has a Chautauqua County history, too. And this is an interesting story in and of itself. And that is that uh, Pronosil came to the United States in 1936, more or less by accident. A, 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 a doctor at Johns Hopkins knew about the sulfa drugs. And John Roosevelt, one of the Roosevelt sons, had an infection. And Eleanor Roosevelt you know, said, what are we going to do about this young man? He has an infection in his right arm. And um, the doctor said, well, there's this new drug that, that is found in in, 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 uh, in Germany, let's get some of this stuff and try it. Well, you know the story. Uh, the, the Roosevelt son was, was, was made better, cured, from the use of the sulfa drug. And two additional things. The Surgeon General from 1934 to 1946 was Thomas Perrin, and his son Ted Perrin lives right up the road uh, near, near uh, the Bemis Point Stowe Ferry. And he argued with me when I told him that story. He said, I got to tell you, I had an infection in 1936, and I was treated with sulfa drugs, too. And I've been trying to get Greg and the him together to get an interview for the Jackson Center about what became sulfonilamide. And that was 1930s. That was the first antibiotic. Pure and simple, that was it. Before that, we were at the whim of our own, you know, our own immunology to take care of ourselves when we were when we were addressed with infection. Uh, the American contributions to the antibiotic scene didn't really happen until after World War II. And the first, at least as near as I can tell, was either streptomycin or erythromycin, which came from Eli Lilly at the beginning and then Merck. And those were drugs that showed up in the 50s, late, mid to late 50s. Penicillin was found by accident in England, 
and those of, a, those of us who remember getting penicillin shots from our doctors in 1945, 46, 47, when these things came around, you went to the doctor's office, if you had an infection, he went over to the refrigerator and he hauled out this little bottle, right? And he had to do it, he had to inject that stuff quickly because penicillin in the natural, in its natural form, was not very stable. And so you, well, what happened? Chemists found what the active ingredient was, the active penicillin ingredient, and as time went on, they made modifications, found that those modifications, when tested against test animals and later against human subjects, were, were better in terms of their, their, their long lasting, and you could, finally you could put them into pills. So our kids don't have to go over there and suffer that shot in the rear like we did, because the penicillin that they now have can be delivered in other technologies. So, but that was an American contribution, but it didn't happen until substantially after World War II. So uh, we didn't know how dependent we were on, on the German chemical industry until we found that we didn't have enough red, uh, green dye to print our paper money in 1916. And so a German submarine came to the port of Baltimore with a load of dyes. It didn't make much difference, but at least the story is a good one. And it's a true story. The German submarine Deutschland came to uh, the port of Baltimore and delivered the dyes that we could use to print our money in 1916, 1917. Okay, you're America, you enter the war, and you win the war. What are you going to do about this, right? And that becomes the next, that becomes sort of the next story. Let me give you a few more forebearer stories because these are important. Uh, the synthesis of indigo by Carl Bosch at BASF was 1897. Indigo was imported from India as a, as a blue dye, and it's still the indigo of blue jeans, right? And, of course, that was expensive. You had to bring it, however you got it, from... from uh, from, uh, from India to, to, uh, to Britain. And the German chemists said, well, we can make that in a laboratory. So they figured out what indigo was chemically, and they went in the laboratory, and by, the, by 1897, Carl Bosch had made it. Well, it became very profitable. So that was, that was really BASF's major contribution at the beginning that was profitable. Aspirin, the story of aspirin, totally fascinating. Aspirin was, is a derivative of salicylic acid, and we, uh, we, we now know that uh, uh, farmers in the Cotswolds would take bags full of the bark of a certain spirea tree to the farmers' markets in places like Chipping Hamden and Chipping Norton, some places that I'm sure some people here have visited. And people would take these bark pieces home and they'd put them in a hot water, uh, put them in tea, and they'd drink the, the, and they found that their rheumatism was better or their headache went away. And it turned out that they did the, the, some of the, uh, by accident, they did some of the tests that were responsible to find out what was the responsible ingredient, and eventually isolated that was salicylic acid. Salicylic acid, an organic compound, the trouble with it is that they get a stomachache. They develop stomach ulcers, uh, uh, stomach ulcers from this. And so an enterprising guy said, I'm going to heat this with dehydrated vinegar and see what happens to it. Out of that came acetyl salicylic acid, which, was, which is aspirin. It was discovered in about 1870, but really brought to market by Bayer in 1899. And, and uh, Carl Duisberg was the person responsible. Why did he do that? One of his colleagues said, well, I know about this stuff. I know about this acetyl salic salicylic acid. And shouldn't we try and market that? So his pharmacologist in-house, I'll give the guy the credit of being a pharmacologist, said, well, yeah, we've got to test it all over the place. And they tested it all over the place, and the pharmacologist was always very del deliberate in saying, well, maybe this isn't the thing we need to, to, to market. We're going to get in trouble. I don't know if they had liability suits at that time or not. But the bottom line was that the guy who had, got, had found that acetyl salicylic acid sent it off to a doctor friend in Berlin who gave it to his arthritis patients and so on and so forth, came back with rave reviews. And in 1899, Bayer began to, uh, to, to distribute and sell aspirin. Uh, you can still buy Bayer aspirin if you happen to live in Mexico or Canada because the trademarks are still held in those countries. Here, it's not. But in Canada, you can't buy Bayer aspirin. You can, Bayer aspirin has the trademark still holds in Canada if you, if you happen to need aspirin. Well, OK. Uh, and uh, the major thing that these companies did was they got together to sell dye stuff. Now, here's another story. This is the story of the barbiturates. The barbiturates were discovered by Adolf von Bayer, a very different person, in about 1865, and discovered on, and, and structure proved on December 4th, whatever the year was. De December 4th was St. Barbara's Day in the, 
in the Lutheran and Catholic feasts of those years. And so out of that came the barbiturates. Well, we weren't sure about the structure, so Mr. Emil Fisher, now a professor at Würzburg, was working with one of his colleagues in, in physiology, <coughs> excuse me, through the structure of, of the barbiturates, and they say, hey, these things are making me sleepy. So he sent a letter to his friend Carl Duisberg, who was now the CEO of, 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 of Bayer, of CEO, the, the, the company Bayer. He said, I've got these compounds that are making me sleepy. Well, out of that came the first sophophoric, and we still use phenobarbital. Why do we use it? It's an anticonvulsant. So it, these are very good drugs that are still part of the, the culture. This is really the first example of the academic industrial interface at work, because Fisher was a scientist in a university and he peddled his stuff into the marketplace. Here's aspirin in the third right. This is where the name comes from. Acetyl, A, spirea bush, spire, and by the way, you can't pronounce that word very well, so let's add an I-N, and out of that came aspirin. Well, what were Bayer's first three products in the United States? Aspirin, heroin, morphine, and codeine. Now, my physician friends tell me heroin's a very good painkiller, a very good drug but it becomes extremely, it, it, the, the, the uh, addiction comes very quickly with heroin. So it was taken off the market. Merck also, which was e Merck Darmstadt, became Merck and Company in the United States, totally separated. Bayer, on the other hand, did not separate. Also, Merck first sold various drugs and heroin and morphine in the United States. Morphine, very old, goes back to the Middle, middle Ages from opium. But acetyl morphine, namely heroin, was much later. Agfa, tremendously interesting story. Agfa, Oxygen Gesellschaft, Farben, Fabrik, and Anilin. Anilin being a coal tar derivative, something you get from coal. Agfa was founded in Berlin by two scientists, Karl Martius, who had, in, who had discovered a yellow dye that was made from naphthalene mothballs. And so he had this yellow dye from mothballs that he could sell to the wool growers and they could then use this yellow dye to keep the moss out of wool and have a, have a yellow sweater. Well, he had a laboratory mate at this time by the name of Paul Mendelssohn. Paul Mendelssohn was Felix Mendelssohn's middle son. Felix, Paul Mendelssohn went from, uh, he, he sort of bounced around because Felix Mendelssohn died when he was seven years old and his mother died when he was 12. So Paul Mendelssohn really was raised by his, grand, uh, by, his grand, by his uncle, his father's brother in Berlin, Paul Mendelssohn also. And Paul Mendelssohn Sr., so to speak, had it figured out that Paul Mendelssohn Jr. would be a lawyer. So he sent him to various schools to get a law degree, and it turned out Paul Mendelssohn didn't like that very much. And somehow after the Franco-Prussian War, he, or after the uh, war with Austria, he ended up in, in the uh, university at Heidelberg, where he came under the uh, laboratory supervision of one Robert Bunsen of the Bunsen burner. And Bunsen convinced Mr. Mr. Uh, Mendelssohn Paul that he really was a good chemist and Paul Mendelssohn then pursued chemistry as his career. Uh, I looked at this because in his obituary in 1880 it said that he died from the same disease that his father died from, heart's Krankheit, with in German, you know, you can it's either a stroke or a heart attack or whatever, we don't really know. But he, well, he died from the same thing that his, his father died from in 1880. And it also said it was Dr. Mendelssohn. So I said, well, what Dr. Mendelssohn? Did he get a PhD at the University of Heidelberg? That's interesting, I'll pursue that. So I called the, I called the uh, uh, library at the University of Heidelberg only to find out that Paul Mendelssohn paid 260 gulden for his PhD. He had money and uh, he was called doctor, but that was before the days the theses were required. Anyway, Paul Mendelssohn died 1880, but his son was on the board in 1935, 1936, 1937 of Agfa, and he was one of five Jews who was asked off the board in 1937 uh, as a result of the uh, racial laws that became uh, just terribly imposing at that time. And here's the story of the Mendelssohn Bartholdi story. Here's one other that has a Chautauqua County connection. Alizarin is a red dye that was isolated from madder root. Madder root was found in the area of, around Zeeland in, in, the, in, in Holland, down south of Rotterdam. Red dye from madder root. It turns out that by, by synthesizing alizarin from coal tar, from derivatives of coal, 
that the matter root, matter root farmers couldn't compete. They couldn't make their matter root extract at the same price that these German chemists could make matter roots dye alizarin, uh, which is pictured here. And so as a result, the matter root guys went out of business. Well, the matter root guys had a Chautauqua connection in that Winnie Llewellyn's grandfather, Bill Hogenboom, was a matter root farmer. So if you happen to know Winnie Llewellyn, whose, whose maiden name was Hogenboom, uh, Winnie Llewellyn's grandfather was a matter root farmer, and the only reason they came to the United States in 1880 or so was because the matter root farms were out of business because of the synthesis of alizarin. Uh, anyway, sort of an interesting sidelight that comes. Now, what, what drove the German chemists in, 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 uh, in, in, at the time that, that Farben was organized? Well, Versailles. The Versailles Treaty uh, basically said that as a result of of Germans in the German invasion of France and Belgium in 1914 and, and the war that, that followed after that, that uh, the Germans would owe to all of these offended countries substantial reparations. I mean, that's a simple story, but it's really the truth. Well, what were those reparations? Well, in the case of the chemical companies, there were dyes that they sent to those countries to sell for themselves. So the German chemists would make a hundred kilos of something or other, and they'd send it not just to France and Belgium and, 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 and England, but the American market got lots and lots of, of imports from Germany after World War I that were part of the reparations payments. But we never signed the Versailles Treaty, we never part of it. We, in fact, benefited for the from the reparations side of things. Well, World War I woke us up as a country, and so what did we do? Well, first place, we, we, we instigated something called the Alien Property Act in 1917, after we went to, to the war, went to war with the Germans. And the Alien Property Act basically says if it's, German, if it's German, it's ours. So that meant all the plants that were Bayer's plants, all the uh, Badesch and Soda Fabrik uh, companies that were here, and more than that, all the patents that belonged to those companies. So the U.S. government uh, absconded, that's not, that's too tough a word, but the U.S. government took patents that belonged to the German, the German companies at that time to become U.S. government property. Now the numbers depend on who, who's, uh, whose data you're reading, but they are several, several thousand German patents that were taken by the U.S. government. What did we do with them? Well, we sold them to an organization called the Chemical Foundation, which was a not-for-profit organization set up, by the way, by the guy who was the chief of the alien property group, uh, and, and you can see the story developing, right? Uh, and, and so Francis Garvin went to now the Chemical Foundation. He convinced the government, they said, should sell all these German patents to the Chemical Foundation for a quarter of a million dollars, which they did. And out of that, the, the Chemical Foundation then started licensing all these patents to DuPont and Dow and all the chemical companies that existed at that time for a highly profitable, highly profitable venture. These guys, had done, the Germans had done all the research, had done all the marketing, had built the markets for these materials. And what did we do when the war was over? And I'm sure that what we did was what was done in, in, in England and France, but the things have been written here. We have some information from historians on it. Uh, we took those, those technologies and used them as our own. Well, you can imagine what intellectuals would think about that in countries like, you know, in, in countries like Germany. And so this is what really drove the foundation of what became the Second World War, IG, IG Farben. Uh, there are several stories that are just really interesting, and I won't bore you with them, but one that is interesting was that uh, the U.S. government, seeing how the Chemical Foundation had schnookered them out of, you know, substantial resources, said, well, we're going to sue you. You know, you, you, you guys didn't tell us that these patents were, were really worthwhile. And so, uh, but the Chemical Foundation's counter to that was, well, those patents didn't tell the story exactly. If you wanted to make Novocaine, they didn't tell you exactly how many grams of starting material you had to put in the, in the flask. And so, what happened was this suit took place in Wilmington, Delaware, in the courthouse in Wilmington, Delaware. And, and to, prove that the, to prove that the patents that were there from the German technology were actually valid, the judge sent a chemist who was an expert witness for the U.S. government into the laboratories of Swarthmore College and told him, now here's the patent, here's the directions, you go in the laboratory and over the weekend I want you to come back Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock with a sample of this particular stuff that was in that patent. Well, he managed it. He got a very, very low yield, 
And in fact, the yield that he got was not commercial. But the bottom line was that he proved that the patent had some validity. And so there was some reason to believe the government did get snookered. And, and out of that came what was now a whole technology that transferred into the private sector. DuPont didn't have any organic chemistry at this time. So what they did is they said it's a lot easier way to do it than to, to worry about patents and have to duplicate it. We'll just go to, we'll just go to Ludwigshafen and we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll kidnap six of those German organic chemists. And that's exactly what they did. Now, these stories are apocryphal. I mean, these are, the, these are stories that come through the history of things. But I think they relate to what goes on in the business world uh, more or less all the time, industrial espionage. So in any event. They provided the reparations payments, and, and this sort of then triggered these guys that had started and became risen to the top in companies like uh, BASF and Bayer to organize to prevent. And here's, here's Carl Duisberg, who became the CEO of, uh, of, of, of Bayer and was the second in command at, BAS, at Tarbin before the war ended. Here's his obituary from the New York Times. And I have to give a plug for the internet. I must say, you know, to find the obituary of Carl Duisberg, who died in 1935, all one has to do is go to the New York Times, type in Duisberg, and you find 10, and you know the one that you want is there, and you read it, and you say, and by the way, out of this, you learn some things that I didn't know, you know? And so, terrific. Anyway, Duisberg, small town guy, ended up because his mother knew Frederick Bayer, working in the plants of Bayer in, 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 in uh, in the, in the Rhine, Elberfeld, and other places. And as a result, rose because of his successes with things like phenobarbital and aspirin to the top of the company and became the CEO. Anyway, so he was one of the, one of the major founders. Here's the other one, Carl Bosch. Bosch was the man who synthesized indigo in 1894 for, for BASF. And the other thing that he managed to do was to work with a German chemist who happened to be a professor at Karlsruhe Technical School of Karlsruhe by the name of Ludwig, by the name of, of, of Fritz Haber. Haber had discovered that he could reduce nitrogen, the nitrogen of the air, to ammonia with water and high pressure, <coughs> but he didn't know how to make it commercial. So uh, Haber's technology was transferred to BASF, where there was this young chemical engineer, Carl Bosch. Bosch was looking for an opportunity between the two of them. They manufactured, made, made it possible to manufacture ammonia from air, nitrogen uh, from the air, hydrogen from, from water, and high pressure. So the Haber Bosch process went online in 1913. What do you use ammonia for as a fertilizer? Why did the Germans need fertilizer? They don't have a whole lot of land. So they wanted to make their farmers as productive as possible. Now, as it turns out, Ammonia can be oxidized to nitric, nitrogen dioxide, NO2. And out of that becomes the, the, that's the anhydride for nitric acid. And nitric acid was really important for the synthesis of things like nitroglycerin and trinitrotoluene. So there were some ancillary benefits. And that, that leads us to the, next, to the next part of this subject, and that is what do you need to fight a war? Now, this is before the atomic bomb, so this is 1935. What do you need to fight a war? Well, you need guns, shells, and powder. Now, it turned out that the Prussian generals forgot that they needed shells and powder when they invaded through the Mar when they when they invaded down the Moose into into uh, into uh, Belgium in 1914. So they got down the Moose and they got started into into Belgium and they ran out of shells and powder. Why did they run out of shells and powder? Well, because the English, being Britannia ruled the waves, had from their bases in the Falkland Islands boycotted or bar uh, uh, blockaded the uh, ports of Chile and Argentina where potassium nitrate, saltpeter, came from. Potassium nitrate was the salt, was the salt, the salt from which one made nitric acid. So 1914, the war starts. They run out of nitric acid because they run out of saltpeter. So what do they do? They take Fritz Haber's ammonia process, and they talk with another professor by the name of Willem Oswald, who's at Leipzig. Oswald said, I know how to oxidize nitrogen, uh, uh, ammonia to, to, to nitric acid, uh, uh, to NO2. And they used the Oswald process, and immediately they were, not immediately, but they were back in business. What else you need? You need by 1935, you needed a car. You needed wheels. So for a car, what do you need? You need gas and oil and rubber. 
I have yet to see a gas, you know, I don't think there are any oil wells in Germany, and I'm sure there are no rubber trees. So what did they do? Enterprisingly, they made all of these things from coal. So where did these things come from? Synthetic fuel oils came from coal, synthetic rubber came from coal, and nitrogen dioxide to make nitrates came from the air. Now the film that we see of Harry Truman's ordering us to blow up the Sinfuel plants at Luna and Opau, those were not the plants at Auschwitz, those were the plants that were in Germany at that time. How could we well stand at this stage the ability to take West Virginia coal, where's Jerry, take West Virginia coal and convert that to, to gasoline that you could drive your hybrid car down the road with next year? We could have used that technology and we could use it right now. And if you happen to, to, to follow the energy, uh, the energy crisis in any serious way, you'll know that one of the biggest growing and developing uh, uh, stock market stories is the story of First Solar. First Solar is located very close to Perrysburg, Ohio, where I happen to live. It was started by Harold McMaster. I'm the McMaster Fellow, or at least McMaster Professor was. Who, who decided in 1978 that he was going to use sunlight to make energy, to make electricity from. He didn't live to see first solar develop, but where, where are all the sales of first sellers, first sellers photovoltaic plants go, plant, uh, uh, photovoltaic panels going? Germany. The Germans are using lots and lots of solar energy and uh, along the Autobahn and on the roofs of their houses and whatever else. So, you know, they're used to alternative fuels, and they did this in 1935. So, ammonia, nitrates, buna, rubber, and buna is, buna is the issue that comes up with the plant to have been built at Monowitz Auschwitz. Uh, buna, the abbreviation buna stands for butadiene and sodium. Butadiene is a product that one gets from coal. It's a low molecular weight hydrocarbon. It's a polyolefin. And butadiene and sodium, when polymerized, this is a polymerization reaction, produce something that has the properties of, of raw rubber, which can be vulcanized and so on. It isn't very good raw rubber, and the buna that they produced for the Wehrmacht in 1930 wasn't very good raw, uh, rubber, but eventually they in fact made rubber that was useful for those wheels that were needed to, 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 start, the, to, to start the war process. Now, Farben in the Third Reich, nothing is ever a straight line, I understand. You know, one of the things I've learned from lawyers, you know, chemists think black and white. There's an answer. It's either yes or no. Does that compound react with water, yes or no? Lawyers say, well, it could be this and it could be that. It reminded the fiddler on the roof a little bit, right? But in, in any event, they think in a, in a very different way. And so the line of Farben's relationship with the Third Reich is not a direct straight line. And another thing that I've learned over my years of consulting is when somebody works for DuPont, it doesn't necessarily mean if you talk to him, he's speaking for DuPont. So my students used to say, well, DuPont says, well, who DuPont says what? And the answer is unless, so bottom line is this is not a straight line. But it is a business line. So some members of the individual companies were members of the party. What was the Vorstand? The Vorstand was the operating or management committee of Pharma. It was chosen from a number of individuals who happened to be part of the larger board of directors. So these were the guys that ran the company. So some members of the Vorstand, Ehrman Budafish, who was mentioned earlier today uh, in the, in the, in the uh, in the uh, film, Airman Budafish was the guy who was responsible for building the synthetic fuel plant at Auschwitz. Budafish was a supporter of Himmler from early on, so he was in fact in the SS. But the general management, Duisburg and Bosch, were both dead by the time the war started. But the upper management, some were and some weren't. And there's a, there's a story about Duisburg telling him, Hitler, in about 1933, if you continue these racial policies, in 100 years there will be no uh, there will be no chemists or physicists left in 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 Germany in 100 years. And Hitler said, "Well, we'll get along without chemists and physicists." And and Duisburg and Bosch were both substantially opposed to the to the to the Nazi regime. But goons took over the country, and that's sort of what where, where we are.
the company supported the Nazis with, with, with bucks, with Reichsmarks, 400,000 Reichsmarks in 1933. Um, and then uh, they benefited enormously. They never could have made synthetic fuel. They never could have made uh, uh, synthetic rubber without the support of the government. Never would have happened. They couldn't afford it. So those were the connections that took place, and I'm going to skip through this. I sort of like this. Roman Prescott didn't come by his, his comments uh, about Supreme Court nominees uh, out of thin air. He came from Nebraska. And Nebraska in 1930 ordered that unless gasoline had tetraethyl lead in it, you couldn't buy it. Well, why tetraethyl lead? Tetraethyl lead's an antinoc. It's something that makes gasoline uh, uh, smoothly burn. The Germans didn't have any tetraethyl lead, and they didn't know how to make it. So it's a toxic compound. It's very, very poisonous. And so what they managed to do was to convince our good friends at Standard Oil, Standard Oil of Indiana now, to loan them 500,000 metric tons of tetraethyl lead. This is 1938. Uh, loan them 500,000 tons of tetraethyl lead for a million dollars uh, to be held in the United States. And the reason that the Germans were able to make 100% oct 100 uh, octane aviation fuel by 1938 was because Standard Oil had loaned tetra tetraethyl lead to Farman. And out of that came gas from coal, tetraethyl lead to make the gas, petroleum, whatever, to make the benzene, whatever we want to call it, whatever the words are, uh, burn smoothly. Um, and, you know, the clergy enters this, too. It enters a little bit. This is Father Newland, who was Father Newland, a professor of chemistry at, at, at Notre Dame University. Newton Rockne's uh, was, his, was his teaching assistant in 1914. He said, I'm going to go be a coach. And Newland said, that's not a good idea. But anyway, Newland was a chemist. He got his PhD at the American University in Washington. And he became fascinated with acetylene. And his chemistry led to two things. First off, it led to uh, uh, his acetylene chemistry led to neoprene, which was licensed to DuPont, and out of that came our first synthetic rubber. And it led to lewisite. What's lewisite? Well, it was a very toxic arsenic-containing compound that was never used in World War I, but was certainly manufactured for that purpose. And anybody in here from Willoughby, Ohio? Painesville? General area? Okay. Uh, in 1917, James Bryant Conant, who became the president of Harvard, was sent to Willoughby, Ohio, to set up a manufacturing facility for lewisite, arsenic, uh, tri uh, uh, trichlorovinyl arsenic. So arsenic with some carbon-containing chlorine compound. And I wondered how much lewisite remains in Willoughby. Well, all right, so this is what the first, this is the first uh, statement at the Nuremberg trial in 1947 by Nathaniel Elias that uh, basically said what I just said. The Germans, without any coal, without any petroleum, without any rubber, without any nitrates, went to war because of their, their chemical capability. Um, Farben at Nuremberg the trials. Um, Nazis were ubiquitous. And this sort of says, um, the prosecutor that you saw speaking was uh, Telford Taylor, who was the chief prosecutor. He was assisted by a number, one of whom was your side, Du Bois. Du Bois uh, has a grandson living in Jamestown, I understand. Uh, died in, uh, about 10 years ago. But he was the chief assistant prosecutor, assisted by Drexel Sprechler and others. Drexel Sprechler and others. Uh, so what did the devil's chemists actually do? Du Bois wrote a book, 1948 or so, called The Devil's Chemist. And, and this was a story of the trial. Waged aggressive war, they were accused of crimes against humanity, mass murder, plundering and spoilage, crimes against the peace, and in cases of three individuals of membership in the SS. Now, I want to just also speak a little bit about the prosecutors. I don't know about the other trials, but the Farben trial had two active participants who were women. Now, this is 1947. It's very... Uh, 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 Eli told me the other day there were probably 3,000 women lawyers in the country at that time. But two who were very active, Mary Kaufman, who presented the case, well, I think it says here, presented the case about Farben's introducing their technology in South American markets. Uh, and I think no case evidences the fact that Nuremberg controlled lives more than Mary Kaufman's. Mary was a young lawyer who was working for Morgenthau in the Treasury Department. She was, she ended up going to, uh, going to, uh, to, to, to Nuremberg 
and uh, she had a degree from Brooklyn College and Smith College, and her library is basically, the, her uh, files are in the Smith College library. Um, Farben defined her life. She talks here in a commencement address at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. I hope you'll join with me when I say I reject the tolerance of corruption in government. I reject the notion that I sit idly by while our cities rot, our minorities are oppressed, our elderly, our elderly, elderly demeaned by semi-starvation and pauperism. I reject the inhuman and amoral, amoral values which dominate our priorities. In the 50s, she defended U.S. communists, then civil rights people. She associated later with William Kunstler. Vietnam pro in the 70s, and for those of you in the academic community, she taught at Antioch in Hampshire. So places that were at, uh, a, a beautiful woman, who I've only known through the literature, Eight, 1985 she passed away, her son we can't find. Here's another one, uh, also a woman prosecutor who was present at, at the uh, Farben trial. This is Bell Mayer. Bell Mayer was from New York. Uh, Bell was one of those uh, very energetic young women who was extremely modest and uh, but got degrees. She got a degree from all places, St. John's uh, College of Law, which is where John Barrett teaches. He didn't know about it. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Mary, Ma Mary Kaufman. She got her degree at Fordham. Anyway, she was recruited by the U.S. Uh, Treasury Department, and she went to Nuremberg in the 46, 47 era, but before that, she'd served on the Bernstein Committee, the Bernstein Committee. Bernie Bernstein was also, he was the CFO, believe it or not, Dwight Eisenhower had a chief financial officer in his, his uh, don't ask me what he did, but I can imagine what he did. Anyway, Bernie Bernstein was Eisenhower's chief financial officer. And he went with him, and then after the war, he knew a lot about cartels and monopolies in the United States. And so as a result, the Bernstein Committee, which uh, uh, Bell Mayer was a member of, really produced all the evidence led to the, the indictment against Farber. Uh, the Bernstein Committee, his report was 1945. It's at the Truman Library, if you want to read it, uh, in, in uh, Independence. Well, OK, but another thing that was part, part of the Farber trial was, was this, and that is the defendants knew not a lot more about the chemistry, the chemistry that was being discussed than did the, the, than did the expert witnesses. So this is the case of Fitz Demir, who was the chief uh, technical officer, cross-examining Nathaniel Elias, who was a chemical engineer with a master's degree from Columbia. This guy had a PhD in organic chemistry from a Nobel laureate. So in any event, it was not a fair contest, but the bottom line was Tamir certainly knew that the Auschwitz plant was being built by slaves who were being con uh, held under awful conditions, terrible. I, I can't even use the words that, that Eli used yesterday. And as a result, you know, the, the, the result was that the cross-examination, Tamir was found guilty. Now, I want to I just add one final thought. Science and government, which organic chemists below were charged as war criminals? Well, you have to know that Heinrich Herlein on the right was. Heinrich Herlein was responsible for the sulfur drugs at the ASA, but they tested on humans at Auschwitz. Top left is Richard Kuhn. Richard Kuhn was a professor of biochemistry at Heidelberg, won the Nobel Prize for his work on the vitamins, vitamin A. Uh, studied, worked in the United States, taught at the University of Pennsylvania. But like many who were part of the, uh, uh, who, were, who were caught in Germany, and I think some of the Germans were certainly in that, in that category, he worked in Germany. His laboratories were not disrupted during the war. But he was asked to study the chemical behavior in test animals of a new, of a new material that had been discovered in the laboratories in Elberfeld of BASF, which was said to be an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that was sarin, the drug sarin, the nerve gas sarin, discovered at BASF in 1937 by Gerhard Schrader. And so sarin was sent to Kuhn's laboratory to test and study. And out of that came uh, some very, very, uh, if you're an organic chemist, you would make these changes, basically. And he made changes in serum that made it more soluble in various kinds of test solvents. And the more soluble serum was 50 or 100 times more toxic than serum was. And that was soma. And so out of this came drugs drugs are not nerve gases, that were part of the arsenal 
that the Nazis had chemical weapons at their disposal in ton quantities at the end of World War II. Kuhn was responsible for Soma. Did he mean to be? He studied the chemistry of the compound. Who are the guys at the bottom? Well, on the left is James Bryant Koenig. And he Harvard graduates of that era. Uh, if you were a Harvard graduate of the Conant presidency, he would have signed your, your, your diploma. Got him on the, the guy on the right is another organic chemist whose laboratory's his office is. I was just a mere postdoc at the time, but his offices were right below my laboratories at Harvard. Louis Fieser. Who was Louis Fieser? Well, Louis Fieser, I happen to have his book here, which I won't give to Greg, but it has the preparation of napalm in it. Louis Fieser, Fieser in 1942, 1943, working for the government, uh, made napalm, which we used in the Pacific during World War II, but we also used it a lot in Vietnam. So these dilemmas, these intellectual dilemmas, the guy that discovers a vitamin finds the most toxic compound you can possibly imagine. The guy who was on the Surgeon General's committee that said that smoking cigarettes isn't very good for you, Fieser, was the guy who discovered napalm and made it. I mean, he actually made it. Conant did more good as a member of the National De Defense Research Committee during World War II. He was High Commissioner to Germany from 1951, 51 and a half to, to 1955. He was there when Conrad Adenauer took over the German government in 1955. But he also was on the committee that led to the Manhattan Project. And he made organic arsenicals in Willoughby, Ohio. The yin and the yang. Who's, who's the war criminal, right? And here are these stories. Well, these are sort of the dilemmas that, that come about. And I've gone on much longer, but let me talk about one person, and that's Otto Ambrose. You heard Ambrose, who was responsible for the Monowitz plant at, at, uh, at Auschwitz. Ambrose, if, if we'd have been able to see it when the indictment was, when, the, when he was asked to plead, his English was very, very good, and he was sort of a cad, I guess, Greg, as we would say, and his, his name was mispronounced. And so he got up and explained that he was Otto Ambrose, and here was the charges against him. Well, he was responsible, he was a direct supervisor of Waller Deerfeld, who built, supposedly built the Boone plant at Auschwitz. So he obviously was a implied he, he received a sentence of seven years as a result, which is what was the contest between Hebert and the other judges. Ambrose was uh, let out of jail, I guess, I don't know what you call it, by John J. McCloy in 1951 with the, other, with the other persons that were still held. 